in Houston. I'm John Herter. It's Tuesday, the 13th day of December. Great as always to have you along, everybody. In a nutshell, From the Experts is a virtual networking accelerator, helping leaders across industries connect very quickly in a brief, moderated, interactive show format. Yeah, it's like a TED Talk with interaction. Uh, well, what's in it for you? The promise, if all goes well, your curiosity spark new ideas, accelerate action, and you may have helped yourself or somebody else solve a problem, make a connection, reaching the opportunity faster. Making authentic connections and expanding your networks has never been more important to your business. So folks, help me welcome guest expert, Karen Knoop. With over 200 co-authored case studies, articles, and books, Karen is a pioneer and an expert in the case study method, which is a primary tool used at Harvard Business School and most universities and executive education programs around the world to teach, test, prepare leaders and their teams. It relies on participants engaging with and debating issues. As executive director at Harvard Business School's Global Research Group, she and her team are highly skilled at developing course materials that help leaders practice and role model listening and positioning for better business outcomes. Karen speaks French, German, Spanish, and a little bit of Italian. When she's not writing, reading, thinking, or other things, she opens her home to world travelers, friends, and pets in need of shelter. Karen, man, I've enjoyed our time together. Just the tip of the iceberg. And I'm looking forward to better understanding how disagreeing can be helpful to get the best outcomes. And how do you actually practice this? And well, why does it even matter for business? So Karen, over to you. Thanks so much for the introduction, John, and for uh, the gift of giving a platform like uh, like this one that is not people talking at someone, but um, people talking together and trying to solve things uh, uh, from very many different parts of the world, very different uh, different backgrounds. Um, thank you for the gift of your time here. I'm going to keep my remarks super uh, super brief. Um, I've sort of I'm coming to this from two parts. So first, as uh, John mentioned, uh, basically. I write case studies all day and case studies are 11 pages of a particular story where you have a protagonist who needs to take a decision. And then in the classroom, half of the class ideally would debate that she really should be buying that business and the other half of the class will argue vehemently against it, but they're starting from the same set of facts. When a class goes well, they're engaging with respect. Um, and when a class ends, uh, you realize that everybody in that room brought something different to the conversation. So this is my professional life. And then in my daily life, uh, like many of you, I've been sort of startled by this inability that we seem to have developed or this ability that we seem to have lost, or maybe we never had it in, in the first place, to sort of engage with people who present different points of views. And this sort of fight in my head um, has led to this uh, to this conversation today. So, get, Gus, if I may ask you to just show uh, the, the visual, um, that would be that would be helpful. So, basically, the way that I envision this conversation is that in one corner we have forces for sort of discord. So, if you think of this in like you know the the fight of the of the century, at least of the of the decade, is on the one hand you have all of the reasons why there is more discord in the world. But then on the other corner, we have also learned a lot about how to make the most of different points of views. And we're going to spend just a little bit of time trying to figure out what is the origin of the situation that we're that we're in and what are some things that we can learn from science, from psychology, and also just from a good business uh, business practice. So disagreeing is very difficult. It's very painful. We tend to dislike it. And when we talk about difficult issues, we tend to jump to conclusions, which is what can we do to fix the climate issue? What can we do to combat uh, racism? And I find that often it's useful, at least for me, when I think about these issues, to go a little bit backwards and to ask myself, you know, how do we get here? So one of the reasons why we might be here is that, you know, we're still dealing with, uh, we still have our reptilian brains that are dealing with the modern world. So we basically have a brain that is controlled by a neocortex. When we get angry or when we get in a disagreement, the neocortex sort of stops functioning and so does the one of the other. So we're engaging in this, you know, sort of arm wrestling of ideas with a brain that has been designed to occasionally be, be overridden. 
in a time when there were f very uh, fewer dangers. But now we have our reptilian brain on social media. And basically the whole day we're winding ourselves up, trying to pick a fight, trying to think of everything that might be negative and, uh, and bad. The second is that pre-pandemic already, a lot of us um, suffered from our focus on mood disorders. Those are the ones that I've uh, written about uh, more. Um, and in the pandemic, you know, anxiety and depression has increased by 25%. The more anxious and depressed we are, uh, the more we tend to fall into cognitive traps. And the cognitive traps tend to be catastrophizing or seeing things in black and white or, you know, foretelling the future, which is everything my life doesn't want to as go to anything. And there's a lot of mind reading, you know, so and so didn't contradict me in team meeting because he made a good point and maybe I made a mistake, but so and so contradicted me because he doesn't like me, because he's always sort of against this idea, because he comes from this particular department. Um, so what is already was a challenge has been, uh, has been even, uh, even worse. Then about 40% of us um, display insecure attachments. So that's out of psychology which is um, basically our relationship to caregivers. And the more secure we are, uh, the more secure we are in our own worth and uh, worthiness also. And what happens when we have insecure attachment, we become uh, sort of fearful or dismissive or avoidant. And when we get information that is negative or doesn't buttress our point of view, then we tend to overreact. A lot of us are, um, we can stay on the, the first one actually, uh, Gus, if you don't mind, but so, sorry. So, you know, a lot of us who, and this seems to have increased because the more stressed the parents are, the more stressed they will be as caregivers, the more distracted they might be. So you see now parents on, on phones. Um, and that also makes it difficult to have productive and uh, productive conversations. Cancel culture is a product of all these forces. And then we are just more diverse all around the world. You know, you can get on your phone, you can get diverse points of view. You can engage with people who might have diverse points of view. We're in a, in a workplace where you have five generations. Um, we are building more diverse organizations in terms of race, ethnicity, neurodivergent, sexual orientation, which should all be a good, and we'll get to how to harness those goods, but they also are a source of stress because we tend to be, um, worried when we understand less, we might have less of the code. Uh, you see, you know, representatives of minorities sort of pretending to be a particular way at work, um, which is very, very toxic to uh, to mental mental well being. So that's kind of I think what we're all dealing with as managers, even as uh, as team leaders. And so one way to look at this is to say that is so terrible. We'll never get out of it. You know, we're polarized, and this is just the way it goes. Another way to look at it is that we now have some tools uh, from science and psychology to, if we all agree to look at it as a problem and come to it from an open mind, then we might be able to fix it. And I think one of the first ways to do it also, particularly in, in teams or, or even in groups, I mean, families or teams, is just to acknowledge how difficult it is. And part of acknowledging how difficult it is is to educate ourselves and also others on how the brain works, uh, the fact that many of us will have very different uh, reactions to um, information that is uh, being given. We will have different levels of reactivity. Um, if you're able to discuss this and if you're able in companies to have training that is basically, this is brain science, this is what happens to us under stress, there is a little bit less of a stigma when it happens to us that we feel so angry or unable to, to engage. And then it also enables you to be more empathetic for others because most of us do not want to be angry or dismiss somebody out of hand. But if you do not understand the mechanisms that will lead you, lead you there. Um, I think out of psychology also, even out of the work of individuals like Adam Grant and Phil Tetlock, you know, there is work around patterns so um, it's very easy for us to behave like politicians or prosecutors. So somebody says something that you don't agree with in a meeting and you will either attack them or you will pretend that it's okay and not say anything and not engage in them. And that's more the politician, which is you may be saying something totally idiotic, but they wanna say, stay on your good side so they will not engage. And what happens in 
teams is that you lose the ability to innovate because all of the friction that you should be getting from the people who have, you know, are bringing all of these perspectives at works are basically being, uh, being silenced. And if you can turn that into the approach of a scientist, which is instead of coming to a situation where there is disagreement or there might even be discord, instead of being you know, a prosecutor or a preacher and starting to go on your high horse, adopt the position of that of a scientist, which is you know, choose curiosity over conviction. Uh, it's very much related to humility. So for those of you who might have a difficulty reading the, the slide on corner two, there's neuroscience insights, psychological approaches, humility, mindfulness, and orchestration. So humility is an appreciation of the relative importance. I'm not quoting it. This is a definition, not verbatim, but I think it's about an understanding of your relative importance, which doesn't mean that my ideas are bad, but it means that in the grand scheme of things, I am not the gospel I do not know. So if you can bring a scientific point of view to discord, which is to say, this person has done this, or this person has said this, can I look at them with more curiosity than conviction, which is, can I engage in them with, in their ideas? Uh, can I override maybe an attribution bias, which is to say that if somebody that I assume to have a bad character says something, then I will immediately dismiss the, the idea. So the humility over pride, I think, is a very important distinction. Um, I think the curiosity over conviction can also be very, very helpful. Um, I think this also ties into mindfulness, which a lot of us practice um, at home or for stress management. But at the end of the day, you know, mindfulness is about being present, um, aware, not too reactive, and also curious. And so when I find myself in a situation where I am in disagreement or everybody else thinks a different way, um, instead of pouncing, I sort of try to think about, okay, what is actually happening here? Uh, can I again be curious about what may be, may be happening? These are all individual behaviors, but I think as team leaders, as team members, um, as managers, if you role play them to say, you know, I have been wrong about this before, maybe, you know, I'm wrong about this again, or in the past, I've tended to catastrophize events. And, you know, the budget meeting was actually quite okay. And to start adapting some of this language in, uh, in, your, in your managerial life. And then finally, I think orchestration is very important, which is much like every good thing in our world, it doesn't happen randomly and you have to sort of make an effort to make it happen. So as a team leader, um, in a particular meeting, you might want to um, assign somebody to argue against you. And you might actually ask a person, as we sometimes do in the classroom at HBS, which is to say, Link, I'm gonna ask you in a little bit, just to give the point of view of the oil and gas industry, would you be willing to do that? And then we, the class would turn to Link and say, and Link would like to sort of explain why oil and gas really, really matters. We'll talk about the, the industry. Sometimes you can pick somebody who's an expert. Sometimes you can also assign this role to somebody who is always in one camp. So let's say there's a team member who is always against partnering with other departments. And you might in a team meeting say, okay, I'm gonna ask Joseph today to argue why we should be partnering. And this does two things. First, it sort of brings Joseph out of where he is. The second is that it enables people to engage with Joseph's idea without Joseph as the person. Three actually does more than two things. Three, it enables you to see Joseph as a person who doesn't always say the same thing because another tendency that we have is that as soon as somebody says something that we don't agree with, we tune them out. And then the fourth is that if Joseph is arguing why partnerships is good, He's coming to this argument from a place of partnerships are bad, which means that he will probably be tempered in his argument and will not go from one extreme to another. So we're here and sort of looking for ideas to, uh, to balance. Another comes out of debate. Some of you might be um, might have debated in school, which is the Lincoln-Douglas debate, which is you flip a coin and you argue either, either side. All of these tools are on surface relatively simple but enable people to speak up in a way that they might not uh, otherwise uh, otherwise do. Um, so I think you know when I look at this sort of tug of war that we're uh, that we're going under, um, I think the first is to sort of learn, which is we all bemoan that we're here, 
but look at the root causes, look at the root cause of what might be happening in your, in your organizations. Uh, second is to remember that we do have the tools um, and we can educate ourselves about why it gets there. And third, I think if you want to harness diverse voices, you need to really signal that you're willing to hear them. Um, what I think occurs a fair bit is that people are like, oh, I'm all for diversity. And then somebody will say something that might be, you know, not what they had expected and sort of overreact. So catch yourself in this practice of not uh, of not over overreacting and um, and really trying to go into into the world as a curious uh, as a curious scientist. Awesome. So one thing that I thought would be helpful for us to do is to you know, first, any any reactions, but also um, what have you used in your practice? What have you seen? Um, how does it feel to you when you are sort of um, experiencing cognitive dissonance? Um, what are things that people can do and not do? Um, you know, there's a lot around body right. languages also, kinesics, it's told, uh, when you approach somebody with whom you're disagreeing with a frown, with disrespect, with raised voices, the other will mimic. There's a lot of mimicry in these conversations. So anything that you do to sort of center yourself, uh, yourself physically, um, we'd we'll, like to learn from from each other on these uh, on these shows. Well, thank you, Karen. And um, we're moving now into the group discussion. So let's let it roll. I see Mel uh, has one question here, uh, but before we do, uh, when you guys are sharing, keep it to about thirty seconds or so, and please give us your name and who you're with. Um, and the group question, which we're going to now put out there for everybody to think, in addition to what Karen said as well, are you proactively engaging in getting the most of your team's diversity uh, for better outcomes? If so, well, how are you doing it? And well, how do you know it's working? So with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and, and see if um, we can go to the floor. And uh, the first person I'd like to ask is LaMonica with uh, Technique Beth MC. LaMonica, I'm so glad you could be with us today. What's your take on what you've heard so far and your experience? Yeah, thanks, John and uh, Corinne for uh, scheduling this. Uh, great topic. Um, I don't know if you noticed me nodding my head throughout. Uh, definitely something that I witnessed. Um, I think for myself as a leader, I've always focused on active listening versus listening to respond which I think is important in this space. Um, and then also being receptive to what that person is saying and hearing them out, re regardless of, you know, whether I agree or not agree. Um, I think, you know, with Technip FMC, oil and gas company, um, the traditional nature of the business creates this discord that you're talking about, I think. Um, it's a it's a traditional business that has always believed that, you know, in order to come and prosper, you have to have that background in oil and gas in order to be seen successful, et cetera, which I think leads to some of the discord that you spoke about um, for for our company. We're at a point where we went through a merger in 2017 and then spun off part of that group that merged uh, last year. So there is a lot of these behaviors that I see on the discord side happening for those two particular reasons, you know, people trying to maintain their footing and be the, you know, be seen, et cetera. So I'm definitely witnessing and seeing some of this in our organization. And it's definitely an area we need to work on. Anything in particular that you guys are, have tried and is it working or not? So um, one of the things we have done, we've kind of used the top-down approach to get our executive leadership team more engaged and kind of showing how they communicate. So like um, with our inclusive leadership uh, training that we rolled out last year, we then set up like these round table like meetings that uh, webinars that um, employees can uh, sign up for and hear more from our executive leadership team and then focusing on, you know, making sure they're focusing on, you know, the listening part, the communicating piece, the trying to, you know, show their commitment around diversity, uh, talking about, you know, biases, because I think biases play a, a huge role in this as well. Mm -hmm. So, so that's been effective for us because most people like to hear from the top leadership. 
but then the next thing is getting it to that middle leadership, which is the most impactful leadership, I think, in that company, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where we've started within our organization. Nice. Yeah. And I think this relates also to a question that Mel had in the chat, which is, you know, what happens when you come into an environment that really does feel one one sided? Um, Agreed. So so switching over to a, a smaller firm, uh, Lynn Frostman, would you mind sharing a little bit about what uh, your take is on all this? Sure. Thank you. And I'm, I'm really enjoying the conversation so far and, and uh, noting down a few, a few great ideas that I've heard. Um, you know, one of the things that we think about a lot is that diversity is critical to our success. We are a startup company um, and we are working in an area trying to do something that no one's ever done before. So getting all of the uh, being able to leverage the collective intelligence is really important to us. Um, and because we also know there are no right answers right now because you know, no one's ever done this before. Uh, so a couple of different things that we're working on. Um, one is to you know, actively discourage people from jumping to conclusions about why somebody might have said something. Um, I think it's Britt A. Brown that says that you, know, it, you always need to be generous in your assumptions about why somebody is behaving a certain way and be curious about it and, and try to find more. Uh, another is that, you know, going back to your uh, Lamonica's points about um, those managers, uh, particularly the frontline and the mid-level managers, uh, we are putting them all through a development program, uh, even, even at our early stage, because we identified that it was really important for our um, anybody who's a people leader to really have these kind of skills, mm -hmm. where they have to go through assessments about how they respond during stress and um, naturally, and, you know, what, what are their natural reactions and then we compare the whole team so that they can see just how different each and every one of them is and why you know one person may respond a particular way another person responds a completely different way and that's totally normal um, and so trying to elevate that idea that we all think differently and we all have different experiences um, and the last thing i'll say is i, I do actively make um, room for the quieter people to speak up. So finding ways to tap into the, the ones who are spending all of their time actively listening and not necessarily talking uh, to allow them to have a voice, but then making sure that I follow up on what they tell me so that they, they know that, that that input is valued. Cool. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I see that Karen has talked about collective intelligence. You can also use polls. And uh, Jason Lee has come back and he says he's got a five to 10 rule that he likes to use, especially with the younger members on a team. What does that mean, Jason? Oh, so I, I, I know I'm a little different here in this group. I'm in the media industry and advertising industry. So when you talk about yelling on top of each other and, and we definitely, definitely do that on a daily basis, right? Um, but I was always taught that you can disagree, but you need to listen first. Otherwise, you're going to come to be the aggressor and you're going to lose your credibility. Mm -hmm. um, with today's new employees that come in, they're so social media focused that they just see one, one situation. When they, when they come back from a meeting and say, how did it go? They start with a comment that's negative or like, can you believe? I'm uh, sorry. It's very simple. Like when you're a kid, take a timeout, five, 10 second rule, calm down. Come back now. Let's talk, mm -hmm. and then they kind of see it. You're not going. They're not always going to agree, and that's fine. In our business, that's fine because we are kind of the aggressive, right? But at least it calms down. Then they can take a breath. They see it very differently. Um, and yeah. I think one thing great in, in our company now, the way they change things is, it, it's it's more a teaching moment on things like this. Um, we, we pride ourselves that, you know, some, if they, especially these days, the young kids come in, they're, they're lacking something. We don't consider that a weakness. We teach them. Mm -hmm. We don't teach them our way. We teach them, hey, this is the way the life is. And then we brainwash you, drink the grapefruit juice and do it our way. But right. we kind of right. help them along the way because if you're going to invest your time to interview and do everything with these kids and, and bring them into the system and fill out the paperwork, you yeah. want to make sure it's the right kid and you keep them in the system. You don't want, and then when they leave, you hope they take what you do. Good insight. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, no, Jason, what I think is nice about also what Lynn shared, especially about uh, having um, these, these trainings where people can talk about these things, 
is that if we do talk about our reactions to stress and if we try to educate ourselves, and again, that it is normal, stress brings us forward, you know, disagreeing is, is good. What I like, Jason, about your example is that you're also not dismissing that individual out of hand for catastrophizing. They are vocalizing because they may be under stress, because they may be falling into cognitive trap, maybe they do not know cognitive traps. And so part of educating, which is the world is not black and white. You know, you, you have gotten trained on social media to like or dislike you know, an entire person's life or an entire story on the basis of a clickbait headline. And just to say, do you realize that you're doing that? You know, why are you sharing negative content? Are you sharing negative content to make your life better? Are you sharing it because you want to make yourself feel better? Is there another way that you can make yourself feel better? So this sort of engaging with employees um, to, to help them learn, I think is absolutely really fun and fundamental. And there are great, uh, great examples, I think, about just talk about what is how different our reactions are to stress. That it is everywhere, but it is super, because I think people also make all kinds of attributions around, oh, you know, so-and-so cannot be promoted because she's stressed out, which is also something we're now seeing in a form of discrimination. And it's like, how do you know? Maybe she presents her stress completely differently from others. So I really like those examples. Well, we, we've got some good comments. Take a look at those from Mel and then Arthur, but, but uh, uh, Tony. I'm so glad you could make it and you're doing some cool things. Uh, could you tell us in a nutshell, you know, what you're up to and how, you know, this is a part of what you're facing? Sure. Um, I work for a small um, nonprofit um, in Washington, D.C. And um, we have a really small staff. So it's really important for folks um, to um, have or keep the lines of the communication open um, because there isn't, we don't have like middle managers. Um, basically, it's just, we have an executive director, um, senior leadership, which I'm a part of, and then we have like junior staff. So I, I manage um, one um, staff person. And so what I've tried to do is keep, definitely keep the lines of communication open, um, ask a lot of open-ended questions. Um, the other thing that I really try to do at our meetings is to, um, I'm very much aware of, trying not to um, give um, assignments or projects um, at the last minute because I know what that does to me. And so there is a tendency, I think sometimes for me to, some people might say I over communicate, mm -hmm. but I'd rather do that um, than feel like I am, um, than, that I am not communicating effectively. And I also often will ask, um, can you do this right now? Because I think sometimes we just presume <laughs> that when we ask someone to do mm -hmm. something that like they have the time to do it. So I always say, if you have time to get to this, please, you know, please uh, let me know. Um, but I really try to, to look at things um, through a team approach. And I do have one question to ask. Um, one thing that I'm struggling with, and I believe probably everyone on the call is as well, is how to how to do all of this in, in a virtual environment, because you don't, it's really hard sometimes um, honestly, to figure out people's body language and like what how they're presenting themselves, um, because you can interpret it one way, but again, to your point, it they could be thinking something else or or feeling something else. Karen, so thank you. I, so I have a an, an, maybe a positive spin on the virtual world, Tony, which may not be not be right, but I think being able to communicate in different ways can actually enable the more quiet voices to be heard. So to Lynn's point, for example, you know, we saw when the classes went virtual, then women spoke more because to speak in front of a huge amphitheater of people glaring at you, maybe some of them were reluctant to, to, to do it. People use the chat. So I like to use chats in meetings because I'm a, I am skew shy. And so I think in some ways, the virtual world, it can give you anonymous polling. You can run a quick Qualtrics poll, which is how many people th here think that this idea is totally terrible. When they're looking at you on Zoom, they might say you're a genius leader, and then you get your poll back, and 80% are like, this is really not a good idea. So I think it, it, there are ways to sort of use this curse of the virtual world sometimes to enable voices to be, uh, to be heard. What I think is difficult is that when you have a very difficult conversation with someone and it goes wrong, they do not see you. You know, you, you cannot go and just tap them on the arm. Uh, you cannot see what they look like when they're getting back to your cubicle space. So it makes... It makes when things get reactive and out of hand, I find very frightening for uh, for leaders and also very disconcerting. Um, and then you have the opposite of my positive point of view, which is 
much like trolls on the internet, when you're behind a screen, you can be mean. You know, when you're a little dog in a car, you're going to bark at the neighbor dog. When you're outside, you're going to be like, ah, maybe I won't bark so much. So I have been in Zoom meetings where things is escalated for no reason. Right. Um, and there wasn't a skill moderator to say, okay, let's go back. Why are we in this meeting? You know, what, we all care about this organization. We all want to go home at five o'clock. You know, can we go back to what we all have in common? Ben? But what do people think about this sort of right. duality of the world we're, we're in? Right. So, so uh, Mark Gregory? Uh, what's your take coming uh, from a, a pipeline distribution company? Again, different from others here. Sure. This is uh, number number one. This is this is a great conversation, and I would like to spend the rest of the afternoon with everybody if your calendars are open because I'm getting a lot out of this. Um, we we are uh, oil and gas pipelines, and so uh, we are we tend to be staffed by engineers and and business folks. So I'm struck by. Um, by Karen's mention of the business case studies and the two sides that developed. And we see this all the time in, in our meeting dynamics. There's, there's a contrast between the static neutrality of the information we're dealing with versus the, the dynamic subjectivity of the participants. And uh, all, all I can share is a couple of tricks that we've learned. Um, I hope they're not too elementary for everybody, but um, in, in interpersonal dialogue and in meetings in particular, you mentioned the quiet ones. Or I heard the quiet ones spoken about a couple of times. We also have peacocks on the other end of the spectrum, right? But sometimes those interpersonal dialogues in, in meetings, because meetings are time compressed, there's already a built-in uh, pressure to them. We've adopted the technique of deflecting the conversation away from two people and onto the whiteboard. The whiteboard's neutral. It, it seems to be uh, similar to what Karen's talking about, establishing or assigning Joseph as the protagonist or the antagonist to take uh, the opposite side of a, of a particular question. So we found by by everybody now talking to the whiteboard and challenging those notes, it takes the interpersonal uh, defensiveness out of the dialogue, if that makes sense. Um, a technique, a second technique that a, an operator, one of our plants taught me some 10 years ago, and, and it may be common in industry, but it was new to me, was, was just in, in any discussion where, where there's an attempt to explain, adopt the position of help me understand, which, which takes it away from, uh, you're not explaining yourself correctly to me, to my standards. It's more of I'm I'm in a I'm in a subject uh, a, a lower position. I'm in a more humble position, and I'm looking to you to help me, which which drastically changes the dynamic. That caught wildfire in our manufacturing complex in Mont Bellevue, and and a lot of our middle leaders still use that technique today. So um, I think what it comes down to for us is is having. Triggers like that or, or, or little tricks like the whiteboard or the help me understand that, that can intentionally prompt us towards humility in those dialogues. And I think humility is the key in, in all of this. It's hard to come by, though. So it's good to have those tricks to help trigger it for sure. So, uh, David, I, I need to know more about what you said, but in just a minute. Uh, but um, I was hoping that, uh, uh, Link, you could share what was on your mind. Uh, and maybe an example that you've faced recently. So much to chew on. This is a, and I think of things uh, at a 50,000 foot view. Um, as a consultant, I've worked with a number of companies around the world to look at already existing programs like EIGs and are these having impact? Are people being more <laughs> included? Are we doing better? And so when I look at a high level view, I mean, we talk about data analytics and built in bias into algorithms. And so I think about all these things and then, and, and coming from a perspective of, I was an outlier in all that data all these years. And, and, and so how do you build people like me and, you know, what's underlying into that, those models, what I see companies doing is, is forming these EIGs and forming these groups that help, you know, each respective group, but it, it what it's also very exclusive. There's still not the full integration and I, and where there's one, one argument that says these are really good people that would <laughs> exist within these communities need that sense of community and camaraderie and, and ability to communicate openly and, and, and have an al allies and leadership to, to fight for, you know, kind of the, the, the social determinants of career, so to speak, everything that affects uh, our culture in the workplace. And then this other half of it that says, well, if we're integrating, and I've heard even high leaders in the LGBT community say, 
we just don't want any collection of information. We don't want to talk about it at all. We want it left separate. And so I see a pendulum swinging where there's, um, where now the conversation and focus is always like, how do we get these people on the far right side, right? Let's put it on right, whether that be moral values, whatever conservative kind of feel, the focus is always bringing them over to be, you know, as more left as they can be. But the pendulum swung the other way. Now I'm seeing exclusion where we're focusing on, yes, we're going to hire younger people and more talent that are diverse. And that's fantastic. Yeah. But talk to the 45 year old middle aged white guy and he's not finding work and he's not getting taken seriously. And so the pendulum is swung. And so it's like, how? And I'm curious to others too, uh, how are you dealing with, with these things? Now that these things are built within your organizations, you're moving along that good, good path. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of companies revert back to say, we're getting rid of these things. They're not having an impact. We don't need an EIG anymore. We've integrated. It's fine. We don't need it. So how do we keep from that pendulum swinging where, you know, I remember over a decade ago, getting rid of affirmative action. You it know, concerns me when we talk about really high level policy and stuff, and I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that, but thank you. Thank you, Link. Any feedback on that, Karen, real quick? So what Link brings, what the comment brings up for me is um, that every action comes with a reaction or has a trade-off. And so every, you know, when companies are engaging sort of willy-nilly in efforts, but not preparing the middle managers, not, not educating people and having productive conversations. I mean, we don't learn mediation. That would be a perfectly good skill for most managers to have basic negotiation skills. And then you leave people to sort of react and do things on their own. And then you have these sort of wild pendulum swing. I think the real trick link is how to persuade the young person that, you know, people like us who are older, um, we were just talking about this actually at the, at the holiday party this morning that my recall is less good than it used to be, but I might have a different form of intelligence. And your, your recall younger person is stellar, but you, you don't quite have my, my point of view. And so again, like, is there a way to sort of enable people to come together differently? So on employee research, uh, resource groups, I'm a little bit ambivalent about them, honestly, because on the one hand, I see their needs. On the other hand, if you do not fit in one of these neat categories, or if you have multiple races, or if you have multiple identities, then you have it feels that you have to make a choice. Um, and so I wish there were a way to do that differently, but I'm not enough of an expert. Uh, Mel that actually, uh, I think has been very involved in uh, in uh, in energy at uh, at Harvard. Mel, um, so maybe he can give us some perspectives on, on that. Yeah. When you do that, Mel, I'm also thinking, well, it has to do with how does this, how can you actually prove this adds value to the business? I know that sounds crazy, but that's how these no, things. Of course. Right? Of no. Course. I, I do have a question I want to kind of ask the group on diversity now that we're kind of getting into it. Well, I've been in this ad, ad game for over 20 years. And, you know, I used to be the only one in the room. Now you look on, on the Zoom meetings and it's almost a diverse, it is a diverse group of people. But I want to especially ask the non caucasian group members, I guess. I, I don't want to be looked at as that minority in the room. I worked hard for what I have. I have, I, I've experienced what I have. I'm knowledgeable. I'm hoping my team doesn't say, oh, he's the token Asian in, in the industry. I don't think they see me as that, um, just based on my experience. I, I honestly think a lot of diversity situation is because there's a guilt factor um, with Caucasians in the workforce in certain industries. You know, I, I can't speak for the rest of the industries, but there are no, almost no agents for right. in advertising. And now so, we have Asian groups and stuff like that, but we all have the same attitude that we're not hired because we want to be that token agent. We're hired because we can bring big accounts um, and, and, and be creative. And, you know, an Asian guy in, in, cre in creative and in in advertising, you're breaking every stereotype. But we don't consider that stereotype. We know it, right? right. It's our peers that I think, in my industry at least, have that issue. 
and they're the ones that have the roadblocks. Got it. So, so thank you for sharing that, Jason. And uh, Mel, do you want to piggyback on that and, and go back to the, you know, how are you guys helping uh, also firms actually not only practice this, but prove it out? Certainly. Um, actually, there might be a, a, an echo. Okay, great. Um, so first I'll say like, I mean, as, as a, you know, black man that works at, uh, at, right, I work with Karn as a case researcher at the Harvard Business School. Um, I have to, I think for me, um, I don't want to be that token person in the workplace, right, or in a meeting. Um, and, and, and I don't think that this is like an organizational, say, like approach, but as a personal approach, the only way I can know that that is true is if I deliver value and I'm confident in the value that I'm delivering. And I have to accept to some degree that other people may question that value. Um, and that's not necessarily okay. And I think that, you know, there are things that need to change, but like, you know, from my own personal sort of professional journey in mental health, I think it's important that you're confident in the value that you're delivering. Um, I think when it comes to, um, you know, sort of maintaining momentum, or I think the biggest thing is setting expectations about what the work is going to be. I think when we began to have conversations about increasing diversity, um, you know, either in case cases or in other places, I heard, you know, uh, you know, people are concerned about increasing the numbers. I think that's very important. Um, but if we make people think that that is the that that's the goal, right? Um, like you say, you reach that goal, people say, okay, the work is done, right. but it's not done. You've got to set expectations at the outset. And I think that I, I was saying earlier that people have to believe, I think at a fundamental level, um, I think managers, hiring managers, um, that diversity is something that will strengthen the business, you know, as, as much as any other input would strengthen the business. You know, if you don't have it, you know, uh, say if you don't have enough capital to run your business, you're trying to figure out how to go get it, right? You're not trying to build the case for it because it's obvious that you need it. Um, the question is, how do we deploy it? And I think that, you know, moving the conversation from how do we make the case to how do we deploy it, I think is a really valuable thing. Um, it, it's, it's a slow moving object. Um, I think getting managers to understand that you're trying to change people's minds and that that's not a fast process, right? Um, it can take a lot of time for people to shift their thinking around deep seated biases, even if they want to. And I think so from an expectations point, um, I think you to not set those expectations at the outset can harm morale once you've reached say some number or you're close to that number. Right. And for some reason, the organization just isn't feeling like it is there yet, right? Because we get into the issues of say conflict, people not feeling valued and a lot of the more internal issues that you might start to uh, begin to have once you bring people with different perspectives and identities to the table. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Man, I wish we had a ton more time, but we're already running over, but we're gonna extend because it's really important. So stay on if you can. Uh, I saw that, you know, uh, who has it, Denise, did you wanna say something? And then David, I wanna get your take on how you're seeing this in uh, a public media out there in Florida too. Hi. Well, I don't have the august credentials of everyone else here, but um, my background comes from trauma, comes from racial trauma, lived experience of racial trauma. So when I think about identity, yes, I'm a very, I have a lot of achievements. I bring a lot to the workplace, to Jason's point. But from my experience, I want my identity to be uh, an an asset to the workplace, in addition to whatever work and skills and talents, because in my case, 
my identity informs how to give trauma-informed care, how to have trauma-informed communication, how to be inclusive, how to anticipate um, triggers in other people, um, how to soothe discomfort, manage discomfort. This all comes from my life experience as well as having been a therapist. But so if I if I wasn't half black and half white and I didn't have the racial trauma I had, I wouldn't be the asset I am. So in my case, I mean, I totally hear what Jason's saying and what others have said about because obviously there's a continuum when you're a person of color, whatever that is there's as much diversity within how you're gonna to respond to your own racial experience or what racial experience you had. So everybody, their relationship to their identity could be different. There are people that don't need their identity to be considered an asset or to be quantified as valuable, but prefer only their work. And then there's people like me where it's like, no, you know, <laughs> this organization is not gonna know what it knows unless I say what I say. So just throwing that out there I, right. I have more to say but you know it's a short time frame and a big conversation Thank well the good news is everybody's going to get everybody's contact info that's what this is about so you can go deeper in the conversations where it's good for you and help with your business so david um you've been listening you've been running organizations with uh different people in different places around the nation tell us uh who you are what you do and what are you thinking uh, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, I'm David Mullins. I manage the public media enterprise here in Tallahassee, Florida, the PBS and NPR station that is associated with Florida State University. Uh, DEI is is really something that in the public television world, I guess even in the M NPR world, you would have expected I mean, who's watched Sesame Street? And you assume PBS is so diverse in, in all that we do and in, in everyone that we employ. But that, you know, that's uh, far from reality. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is uh, an active uh, engagement to try to do our best uh, to employ a diverse work, uh, work staff here at, uh, at all public media stations. But if you look uh, around the nation uh, at managers of PBS and NPR stations, uh, you'll probably see more white males and probably older white males that look like, unfortunately, look like me uh, than than, than any, anything else. So public media needs to do a much better job at that, at the, at the leadership level. Right. I think it is a top-down type of mentality that, that should be there. And in a lot of cases, what we tried to do here at WFSU is really kind of start it from the bottom up and have our team create a DEI committee that unfortunately began right before the pandemic and because of our hybrid work environment has not been able to kind of pull itself back together. Uh, John, you put, you asked the question or, or made the, the point of how to deploy uh, diversity, and I think that's that's in, in some cases the, the the hard the really hard part of this. Uh, as we look at at candidates for jobs, uh, the, uh, diversity is is front and center for what we attempt to do in our recruitment or in our selection of of candidates. But so many times there's not a diverse uh, pool of candidates that are even applying for positions. So we look for advice of how can we how can we recruit a more diverse candidate pool and haven't found the the, the right the the right the right recipe for that yet. Any any feedback on that? Anybody got uh, recruiting tips? Uh, so David, actually, I have a very good friend who's uh, specialized in this area. So I can put you uh, I can put you in touch. And he's actually writing an article around how to um, help people interview better, present better. So I can share that uh, that with you. Put in uh, put in the chat. Um, I think you know when you're bringing people onto your organization, if you bring them on because they look a certain way, I think an organization needs to make sure that it doesn't conflate or pigeonhole the person into a particular identity. So I am I am hiring you because you are a human being whose entire entity brings something. But then if I turn around and sort of pigeon you as, oh, you know, she's Latina, let's ask her what we should do about the Latino market. You know, you're asking one person to sort of conflate their entire being with an entire set of people and certainly be the only one speaking. 
uh, for so I think it's also when there are conversations where different points of views are being brought on that we not be lazy in our thinking and sort of just deputize, you know, or, you know, these people can think about that and we'll keep on going with our own thing rather than us all grappling about, mm -hmm. we have Latinos that are underbanked, you know, why is this happening? How can we get more Latina women to fight for their and their rights? You know, and these guys, that is, it is all of our collective problem. Um, and um, so Denise, I agree that we, we need to not deny people's identity, but what I try to catch myself doing is sort of attributing a whole set of responsibility or pigeonholing the person in like, oh, this is Karen. She's going to talk about mental health at work because that's what she always does. And we're going to stop listening. You know, So how do we keep on listening and make the conversations uh, our own? Um, yeah, so until he had to leave, but uh, he's left uh, the information, which you'll, you'll have his contact info. He's an expert in this area. And um, honestly, we're over time. Is there any last comment? Before we uh, close this out, feel free. Hey, John, I just wanted to make a point. You, you asked, what are we doing in public media? What we've done recently is we've launched an, a multi-part podcast titled Not So Black and White, A Community's Divided History. Oh. And what we've done is kind of pulled the scab off of and, and, and allowed conversations that happen within this organization, but more broadly within this community. Uh, so I think that's where, if conversations can happen within the community, then diversity in the workplace can only be helped. I would, I would hope. I, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. you know, it starts in schools. I mean, the schools are more desegregated than they used to be. There's so much against us. Like there's so much in corner one. But right. if we can identify it, we can work uh, actively against uh, against it. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining and for your your ideas. Yeah. And David, uh, while I'm signing off, would you kindly add that link uh, into the chat so we can grab it? Yeah, yeah let, me find it. let me find it. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. So folks, how was the discussion today? Please take the 30 second survey that we're going to drop in the chat right now. Uh, and to let you know that the uh, post show notes will actually hit your inboxes pretty soon. And that'll have everybody's contact info along with the chat. Uh, but next up on FTE, our 2023 season begins January 24th with global hydrogen expert Rick Butel from Bloom Energy. He'll be discussing how they're unlocking and scaling the power of hydrogen. February 7th, President and CEO of HCS International, Steve Hughes, will be sharing global supply chain issues learned from the pandemic, and more importantly, the new insights on how procurement, ocean freight, and manufacturing are optimizing uh, moving forward. It'd be nice to have more things on the shelves that we've been used to, right? So anyways, listen more and register uh, on our website, fte.network. Oh, by the way, our 2023 call for experts is now open. Interested? Contact us to learn more. Well, folks, we're out of time. Karen, thank you once again. And, and all of you for making time to connect and learn on From the Experts. Wish you a great holiday. Happy holiday, everybody. Yes, and happy new year. And happy new year. Thank you, the happy one. <laughs> Around the corner. Awesome. Thank yes. you, everybody. Thank happy you. holidays. Great. Please, folks.